My name is Courtney Jordan, and I'll be filling in for Eric Steinborn today. We're also recording today's meeting if you'd like to check it out later. So, some really cool news. Uh, Tom Atkins, would you stand for us? Okay. <laughs> we have to hear <laughs> Tom, who was part of <laughs> Tom was part of New York State ITS WebMY made a triple eight core commit. So let's give him a round of applause because that's pretty awesome. So Tom participated in the mentor sprint on Friday in New Orleans after DrupalCon. So if you go to DrupalCon, you too can be like Tom. You could have the chance to be a core contributor and have your name go down in history. Uh, another cool piece of news, um, our very own Greg Marshall, who's part of New York State ITS WebMY, wrote a really cool book on uh, Mastering Drupal 8 Views. We have some uh, really cool cards up front and on the side, and we can provide information um, in a follow-up email if you'd like to find out some more information. Um, it's called Mastering Drupal 8 Views, and it's really cool. So check it out. So, for this month, we have two awesome presenters. Uh, Jeff, is it Gerald? Gerald. Gerald. Gerald and Meredith Kate. Jeff is the technical lead for the Office of New York State Controller, and he'll be starting us off with Google Beginners Corner. And then followed by Meredith Case, who is a designer and developer for the New York State ITS at WebMY, and she'll be sharing an intro to Drupal 18. So without further ado, here's Jeff. To, um, have, sorry, I have Patrick McMahon here with me also. He's assisting me over at the office. We're going to be working on implementing Drupal at our office. Currently, we have a website that's put together like how traditional websites have been put together a file system with uh, a lot of markups on HTML files, um, CSS, JavaScript, images, PDFs, spreadsheets. And um, it's been constructed the traditional way that you would expect um, sites to be um, constructed. But we have um, the unique challenge of having to manage different divisions that have different needs, um, serving different audiences, which I'm pretty sure is probably um, not too far different than a lot of you in here. So um, we've decided um, managing a, a site would be better if we managed it in a content management system. So at our office, what we did was we evaluated three systems, Drupal, WordPress, and Joomla. And um, I'm sure there's tons of content management also saw that uh, a lot in, in government entities, um, uh, the White House being one of them, um, Australia, I think most of you have heard, you know, a lot of government entities in uh, cities, states, and countries have went the direction of Google, and it seems to be the, uh, the lead candidate for a content management system in that regard. So um, we found that to be the same case. We found that Google was the most robust of the three that we tested. Um, Security, security is up to par, and um, our functionality and interoperability, all those things that we were looking for, that, that's with Drupal, and so we made that recommendation, and that's what we're going to be moving forward with. So um, we are currently um, work, work, working with Acquia um, to uh, help us get Drupal up and running. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of Acquia, but Acquia is a, a company that is um, um, pretty much primarily um, specialized in Drupal everything, getting you a Drupal instant up and running. They, they provide support. Um, the the um, folks at the cloud servers, they have a cloud platform that they utilize, they, they have as an option, um, so you don't necessarily have to have your infrastructure in your, in your entity. Um, and um, that's the direction that we decided to go. So we're currently in talks with Acquia, and um, that's where we 
we currently are. Um, so with that, I'm going to kind of start off with the uh, Drupal basics. Um, we're going to assume that um, that you've already installed Drupal. I have a fresh Drupal uh, install that I downloaded last night that we can start with for the presentation. One of the um, things about a content management system um, is that it allows you to have many different people working on one system. It allows you to manage all your content under one umbrella, which is, which is nice. And um, in terms of maintaining the actual system, it's, you know, you're maintaining one place and it's applicable via private application. So you're not constantly worried about if this is up to date, if that's up to date, different artifacts, different scripts, or, you know, within your site, it's all under one roof. Um, I found the best way for me, um, and that, that's probably the direction we're, we're still going to talk about Acquia, but for us to get Drupal up and running, we decided to go to Acquia's um, dev desktop. And what Dev Desktop is, is a uh, service that allows you to, in order to run a Drupal uh, um, application, and it's the same thing with um, Joomla, WordPress, or many of the applications that you would be running, you need a, a, a standard suite. You need a My, My Apache ser server, and you need a PHP uh, database, as well as the actual application itself. Uh, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. So with those, with those things, you would be able to get a Drupal instance up and running, but you would have to actually get those things many different ways to get it. Um, there's um, companies and services out there that lets you uh, download WAMP stacks or, or um, MAMP stacks if you're using Mac. But um, I found MAMP if you're using Unix or Linux. Right. I found since I'm using um, a Windows uh, machine, um, Dev Desktop 2 worked best for me. So I downloaded Dev Desktop 2. When you download Dev Desktop, Dev Desktop, Dev Desktop it actually comes with the um, <coughs> PHP and the database all set up for you. Um, and upon launching it, it'll initialize the, uh, the server. As you can see right here, that's, that green light indicates that that's running, and so is my database. So um, the one thing I've found that I like about Dev Desktop 2 is you can actually manage your Drupal instance all in one place. If I want to get to my application instance, it's a one click of a link right there. If I want to get to my file system, same deal, I have a link that allows me to um, tap into my file system, which is a little bit more advanced than we're going to get into this session. But, um, you know, I can if I want to. So to get started, we'll start with actually getting to the application by clicking that URL. And that will take me to my uh, Drupal instance. Now, when you first download Drupal, um, there is some setup and configuration um, necessary, but we're going to assume that we've done that, and here we are with my um, fresh Drupal instance. Now, with this content management system, there's the, one of the things that I um, appreciate about most content management systems, but more so with Drupal, much of what you're going to be doing and looking for is right above here um, in your dashboard. You have all these options here that are pretty straightforward and intuitive, and it'll tell you, um, it'll get you to most of what you're trying to do within the application. Now, as of right now, he's currently logged in. Uh, the, that toolbar at the top is not visible up there, and I'll show you that now. So this is a default instance of Drupal uh, with the user not logged in. So that's what you would see. And for purposes of, um, there's times where you may or may not have the URL um, available, but um, a good rule of thumb to remember is a uh, slash question mark um, is it equal to user. That's if you don't have safe, um, um, clean URLs set up on your server. If it's clean URL set up, it would just be slash user. If not, you would start then you'd have to use the question mark. Question mark. So that's just a way to access the login screen if you ever lose it, if you ever need to get to it, this is the way you log in. And it's question mark Q equals user. All right, so I just logged in. I'm a user. I'm going to assume that, um, I mean, with within this application, of course, there's going to be many different types of users. Um, we're going to simulate the uh, uh, just an everyday content provider wanting to create a basic page, um, publish that page, and have it viewable by by the public. Um, there's a few other things that we'll demonstrate in here as well, but one of the things that we're trying to key in here is how easy it is to accomplish basic everyday tasks within a content management system like Drupal, as it would as opposed to how it's 
understand, you know, the standard way of doing it where you need to know some level of markup, HTML, some level of CSS. Um, and in today's world with um, dynamic websites, you would need to probably have some idea of how to use scripts and leverage uh, some libraries and APIs. But within a system like Drupal, it doesn't necessarily require you to be a, 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 a code um, a coder or a developer. going to say, all right, I'm a content provider. Um, titles can be, um, it can vary, but I'm a content provider. I'm somebody in the agency that needs to provide some of, you know, some kind of content to our application or our website. So I would log in there as my user, and then I would look up above here, and I would click content, which will bring up that screen. And within here, we would, um, again, the biggest thing here is a lot of things are pretty straightforward. It's very intuitive. I found other other applications may be more or less intuitive. I found Drupal to be um, pretty straightforward. One of the um, misnomers, I think, when we were going into Drupal, people were saying, oh, you know, you need to be a, a rocket scientist or a, a hardcore Java developer to, to be able to manage a Drupal site. I, I, I didn't find that to be the case. I found that a basic, um, you know, if you've ever used a, a work processor like Microsoft Word, Content here, I would come to this menu, then I would click this link here that says add content, and then it would give us options here. Now, by default, Drupal, a, a fresh installation of Drupal is only going to come with those two content types, and we'll get into a little bit more of the content types in a little bit. But um, you can add different kind of content types um, to meet your needs. Um, Drupal doesn't assume anything, it doesn't assume that you're going to build a website, a blog, it just gives you a basic framework to accomplish the task. So it's also why they state on the website that Drupal is a content management framework. Right. As opposed to uh, content 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 system. System, like a WordPress or Drupal. Yeah. So um, right now, we're going to utilize the two um, core content types that Drupal comes with. I will start with them just assuming that we want to create a basic page. It's as simple as clicking that link there. Then it brings up this screen. And this allows you to. Um, start adding and editing content. Now, I um, again, a fresh instance of Drupal will not come with this toolbar. Um, what I had to do is I went to go get a plugin called CK Editor. And CK Editor is a standard editor that allows you to have these um, options up here to be able to massage your content, just like you would do in Microsoft Word. Um, so by default, it doesn't come with a CK editor. I will show you how I got the CK editor here, but just for time purposes, I already had it here. Um, so um, I would add a title. Um, this title, we'll call it. This is the edit screen for a content type, depending on the fields that were defined for that particular content type that you're creating, those fields would be on this page. And so that title is the title of this particular basic page. And then I would go and add content, which I currently don't have, so I'll go get some. All right, so I just added some basic content. Um, why not have two paragraphs? But again, um, this is no different, uh, very similar, I would say, to using Microsoft Word. I just grab content from a, a, a website or some generator or whatever, and I copied and pasted that right into the body section of that um, editor. And again, like on, you know, just like in um, Word, I can do things like bold, um, you know, text. I can um, italicize things if I need, you know, italicize things, and it does recognize things like. Um, just recognize short keys, short keys. <coughs> so, um, again, I can do basic editing. I can, um, you know, do the, pretty much.
much the same things you would see in, in, in Microsoft um, Word. If I want to add um, an image, I can. I can go into here and use a, a URL to add the image, or I can use my image uploader. Very little things um, like um, positioning, um, you can paste in plain text there, just a regular paste. I can look at the source and look at it. Because, you know, some people are more comfortable looking at it um, from a markup standpoint. You can see you have your paragraph tags. Um, Dummy. <laughs> and um, so now we're looking at it from a plain text standpoint. I click here and it'll bring me right back to the, uh, the editor as it was prior to that. Okay. So I add my content there, however much I want to add. Um, and I will then proceed to um, seeing what I do. After my content is added and I'm comfortable with what I have, I have my title, I have my content, I want an image, whatever the case is. Now we want to know um, about publishing content. Now, by default, this, this uh, checkbox will be checked, which is published, which means when I go down here and save it, this particular page will have a title and that content, and it will be published. If I don't want that default behavior, I would uncheck this box. I would save it. Then it would be in a state where we'd be able to look at it, but it's not viewable by anybody.
shows, and by using the, your filters, you can find exactly the content that you need to work on. The second column is your bulk operations or update options. Uh, this is where you can select a bunch of different content by checking the checkbox on the left side of the content and then using a bulk operation. A lot of times it's publishing, unpublishing, deleting, and many other items that you would need to do on any content pieces at, its, at the same time. You can also have, there's another tab over here, quickly going to, if you were allowing comments, this is where you would manage your comments for that particular con uh, content and basically. Now often, we're not gonna have, um, we don't see a need for that ourselves, but you, if you're in DC and DMV for comments, we would rather not have um, that field um, visible, so we would bring the data back for ourselves. <coughs> That's the basic way of creating content. Again, we only had two content types here um, when we wanted to add content. We only had a, a, a basic page and an article. Articles would be the same, relatively the same thing. We'd have a title field. Now, with, because it's an article, we can add tags to it. Um, we can get into tagging if you want. So we had a, uh, you know, uh, an article about fiscal, fiscal stress, which is something that we, Cindy would <laughs> appreciate that. We can hashtag it. We can put a hash here, um, tag it, and have that, um, content here with our basic editor to do the same thing. We can add media, we can format, we can um, find things, center, right, so forth and so on. Just like we saw with the basic page. <coughs> and the tags don't need hashes, but you can if you want to. Now, um, before we move on to, to um, the next thing, does anybody have any questions? So um, next thing that we're going to move into is um, how simple it is to create a user, um, manage a user, um, look at roles and permissions within a, a framework like this. Again, within um, the tradition, a traditional standpoint, if you have a, a site like we have it now, roles and permissions are managed um, in many different ways. But within a content management system, it's in one place. Um, button here, the link here says people, which is pretty intuitive. You would think that um, that's where you would go to manage users. So we click on the end of our screen here where we can now add a user or manage a user. And much like the content page, uh, you also have three sections here, the filter section, the bulk operations section, and the list of users. So right now we have one user. Again, I just downloaded this. So I'm the only user in the system. Um, if I wanted to manage myself, I would click Edit. Um, that click there. What I can do here is I have a username that I can edit. You know, password, email, change a password here. I can change the status whether I'm an active user or blocked user. For some reason, you need to block a user. Um, do that. I can manage my roles. Um, whether I'm an authenticated user or an administrator, and you know, I can add a picture so that. Logged in, I can see it right my profile picture in case that's something that you would like. That's an option you have. And under the roles section, it's going to list every role that you've defined. Uh, the Drupal instance does come by default with those two different roles, but you can make other roles as we will be demonstrating in the next short video. So I'm going to click out of here and just kind of go back to the basic creation of a user. I'll go up here, top left, click on people, and then I want, if I want to add a user, Very intuitive, very straightforward, and this is, I think, this is all out of the box, Drupal 4, um, nothing special going on here. I clicked on um, Add User, and what this allows me to do now is to add a user, so I'll give that user a name. I'll give it, um, um, I would have that user's email address. I would uh, set up a default password, um, something that you don't care too much about that you can give every user or however many users you have that they can change later. So for the purpose of the demonstration, I'll say summer, one, two, three, four. 
very secure password. And then um, the nice thing about Drupal is it's caught up. Um, this uh, Drupal, I think, forget which version you start doing this, but they have a, a bar here where you can actually see the strength of your password. I'm sure many of you who have online applications have seen it a million times before, but it does that. And it also tells you to verify that your password is matched so you're not really having to think whether it does or not. Again, I can go and I can, when I'm adding this user, I can have it as an active user or a blocked user. Being that I'm creating a brand new user, I would, I would have that user active. And then I can assign this user a role. An authenticated user, I can make this user an administrator, which would give them administrator rights. I can make this, um, uh, I can notify the, the user. Um, and a user can be part of multiple roles. Yeah, you can have more than one role. Just and if I click in this link here, it'll say notify the user that there was an account. So by, by having that option on, the user will get an email saying that uh, Drupal has created a, uh, a, uh, a user account for you. It'll give you your credentials. And inside of that email, there will be a link that will let you click and access your Drupal instance so you can log in and change your password and proceed with um, being a community to the system. Now, again, um, there's some options up here. As Patrick alluded to earlier, this will get me back to all the list of users, and this will show me the permissions, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, so I've already went through the whole thing of adding myself, and that's why you see Jeff Jarrell here. So we're going to kind of skip over and go back to the, going back to the edit. I'm going to assume that I went in my email, I clicked the link, I went back to the system, changed my password. Here we have some shortcuts. You can um, do some things here, uh, uh, create a, a new set, or choose a default set of shortcuts to use. Right now, I'm just leaving that as is. This is more advanced stuff. But this is more, yeah, this is kind of getting further into user management options. These are just more uh, personal configurations uh, at this moment in time. Basically, you would only need to focus on creating users, editing users, and permissions. Now, this screen here lets you manage permissions. The, you have three columns here to your right. You have an anonymous user, you have your authenticated user, and you have an administrator user. Those are the three types of users that Drupal comes with by default. You can add different kind of user sets. Um, as you go down these columns here, you can talk about some of these things. You'll see what you're allowing your users to do um, by looking at the column and then the corresponding row. So if we're talking, if we want to see what a, a particular user can do for a block or for, a, you know, within a CK editor, commenting or contextual links, so forth and so on. We have our dashboard. There's just different things that a user can or cannot do within a system. And by checking or unchecking these options in these columns as they correspond to these rows, we'll be able to give or take away permissions for types of things. For a role. I'm sorry, for a role. Have, but all that is managed here. And if we added a different type of role, you would see another column here for that role, and then you could add that permission for that particular role. It's just the same way, it's all within one place. Along with as you add content types, there will be new options in your permission list that will allow you to give those permissions to a particular role. For instance, if we created a custom content type called test, then you would have options for creating test content, editing test content, deleting test content, along with also editing, deleting, and viewing of content that other users have created. So for every content type you've created, you'll also have correlating content type permissions. So that's pretty much user management roles and permissions. Again, it's managed. So we select the permissions tab, and you'll see a subsection of permissions and roles. If you select 
roles, you'll now have the option, a list of all the current existing roles. To create a new role, you simply give it a name and hit Add Role. You'll notice on the left side, there's a four directional arrow on each item. You can click and drag them up and down to change their order. And then hitting Save Order will save that change. If you want to just edit that particular role, you can hit edit role, which will bring us back to the permissions. Uh, I mean, back to this page to change the name of it. And then you can save those changes. If you wanted to say roles or role one. And then if you hit edit permissions, this will bring you back to the permissions tab, but it will only list that, per, uh, that role. So you can edit that, that one with the ones available to you. So again, I could just can check these boxes and say, all right, I want test role one to have, you know, um, access to blog, CK editor, support, and so on. And so if you go back to just click, if you click on permissions, again, it should give you all of your roles. And so as you create more roles, you'll have them listed here, and you can see what roles have certain specific permissions, and you can cross-reference them based on the other. But again, we just created a, a brand, we created a custom role, test role one. It required very, we didn't do any back end programming. It required a couple of clicks of the button. We managed it in one place under people. We had different tabs, permissions, which has these two um, options in there roles, permissions that allows you to actually access the roles that you created and manage, uh, and manage it all in one place. And when you edit a user now, that, that role will actually show up. So that's a quick overview on um, um, roles, permissions, users. Um, any questions there? Or rolling on? At any time, if anybody has any questions, just stop me. I'm just going to keep rolling. I'm very comfortable with the back and forth. Um, so now we're going to. Um, so we just looked at how to create basic content. Um, now, we saw that we only had, by default, two. Um, content types that Drupal comes with an article or basic page, but we often know that there's much more types of content that we're going to be utilizing in our everyday jobs, and we may see uh, that we need new or additional content types. So we're going to show you guys how to do that. Right here we have a uh, section called Structure. Now, structure is much more than just creating content types. There's in there about blocks, there's views, and that's much more advanced. Defines the structure of your site. Right. So under here, you see an option here called content types. And under content types, we can click that, and we can have a, we have an option here to add a content type. Now, right now, you can see that we have the two default content types that Drupal comes with: our article and a basic page. And one common theme, or one common thread you'll see here with all these different options, whether it's Managing content, managing a user, uh, doing something within our structure. Drupal has this uh, interface that um, allows you to see what you're doing, and it puts things in rows, like in, in a table format, where you have your columns and rows. Your row will be, you know, uh, will specify the thing that you're doing. It'll give you options to edit that thing that you're doing. Basic operations for that particular thing. It's a common theme. It's a common way to keep you uh, keep things easy and easy to find. Easy to navigate through. Um, I found that to be very useful starting through what getting this thing. So we're going to add a new content type by clicking Add Content Type. We can give that content type a name. Um, that name will appear when you look at it. We can give it a description. And um, That's optional. You can disable that. You can make it required if you so choose to. But 
that's all within this um, option tool right here is the Windows Pro settings. You have publishing option, you have display option, comment date, menu settings, and click. So here you'll have your different uh, publishing options. You can make it by default to be publish checked at the time that you start making the content, or promote to front page. Uh, when that is checked, it allows your content to be displayed on the front page once it's saved and published. And then stick to top, uh, you can have multiple content that's listed on the front page. Stick to top pushes it to the higher level. It would basically give it a lighter weight, which brings it to the top of the list. And create new revision. If you have that checked, it will automatically create a revision every time you hit save. <laughs> Settings. That is just to display the author date that was created and stuff like that. Uh, most of the time, you're probably going to uncheck that because unless you're at a new site, you're not going to want that information being shown on every page. Every comment setting, which we probably won't have. Uh, comments uh, that just gives you comments at the bottom of a content type allows users to interact with the content. Menu, menu. Everything here add the content to a menu, which in under structure you can create new menus, and you can then assign that content to a menu by default if you want, for instance, uh, test content to always show, uh, always be added to the main menu, you would have the main menu box, checkbox checked, and you can even define a subsection of main menu in the drop-down below. So then when we are happy with our Select, we click on save content type, or we can click on save and add fields, which is more likely. Which is more likely what you're going to do. You probably want to manage your fields for that particular content type. So in that case, we're going to save and add fields. By default, the content type always has a title, but does not have any fields. It has a body, but you can also delete that. You cannot delete the title. So we can we see the fields that we have for this particular type of content right now under the manage fields tab. See, there's other tabs here available with different options. Right now, we're going to look at the Manage Fields tab. We have a title, we have a body by default. We can add a new field. Um, Let's do it. Let's do it or something. So we give the field a name, which also automatically generates a system name for that field. And you'll see the system, the machine name, right next to it, which is called Field underscore Text. And you can also edit that if you wanted to, but typically you don't have to because usually your name is going to be detailed enough that the machine name will work. And you have a type that you can associate with the field. Uh, future modules and stuff can also extend your options for different content types. So if you're not happy with the content types you have, you can just simply go on to google.org and download modules that extend this. So I made it. Content field that has is a list of widgets that you can select. For instance, media fields and file fields will have different kinds of widgets for file uploaders and other different options for filling in that field. It's basically the interaction with the user. So then, when you're happy with your options here, after you managed your fields and added a, you gave it a name, you would click save, assuming you. Each uh, field type has different options and configurations. A text field is fairly simple, so it only has one option, which is a maximum length. But other fields will have other different configuration options. So now I say save field settings. And I've saved the settings on the fields. Now remember, I didn't save this um, before, I, uh, so now I'm going to save it now. And now we have our. is uh, how you can configure the location of your label for your field. Um, you can also have options for having text in the field, or specifically the text fields, if you want to have a little 
kind of a guide to the user of how to use that field or what information needs to go into that field. Just go to manage fields. Hit edit. So here you would have size of the text uh, text field. Uh, that's going to be in this situation will be the width. Uh, you can have helpful text, which will show up as the alt information. So if you mouse over the field, it will give you a little um, clue as to what you should be doing with the field. Uh, you could also check the box of required field. It makes it a required field, and the form or well, the content type form will not allow you to go further unless that field has been entered. Default text value. Any field can have a default value, even image can have a default image. So you can set up default values for these things. You can also, for text processing, uh, we have it currently set for plain text, but you can also have it as filtered text, and other modules also extend that further, uh, full text or even PHP. So then we would save our settings. So we're going to assume that we're happy with everything. That last option, I go back to this. For fields where you would want to have multiple instances of data being entered in, we currently have a, a number of values entered as one, but you can have unlimited. You can define a certain number of, of times that you want someone to be able to enter into that field. So if you had a text field and you want them to have, uh, you, you have a maximum of two times that they can enter into the field. Hit two, and what will happen is that field, after they entered it in, will give a new field underneath it and allow you to enter another value. So then we, just, we saved all our settings and our options. We, um, then, as you can see now, we created a new content. We go back to content, and when we want to add content, we'll now see content type available in a list of content types here. So now we can use that content type how we see fit. And that content type, when you go into it, you'll notice that new text field that we just entered. So we just covered um, content. Content option will show you how to create new pages, uh, basic article, or your own custom content type. We've covered people or roles in terms of users, how to add a user, how to manage their roles, how to manage their permissions. And um, with the little bit of time that we have, we're going to quickly just fly through some other things you may or may not need to know when you're um, just getting up and running with Drupal. Um, under the appearance section, here's where you have your themes and your theme setting. <coughs> right now, um, we have our Bartik 7. These are the, the default themes that Drupal comes with. Um, they're not really fancy. They're not anything special. You can have as many themes here as you want. These are some disabled fields in this section. Neither one of these are disabled or are, are enabled. If you wanted to enable them, they're as easy as clicking this link, enable, or we can enable it set it to our default theme. Same thing with Stark or any theme that we may have in our list here. There can, if, you had, if I had three other themes here, you'd see it listed here. We could do the same thing, enable or disable it, control the uh, description of it, and so forth and so on. And if you can scroll to the bottom there, uh, you'll notice a option at the very bottom here. This is how you set your administrator theme. Everything we're looking at right now is through the seven theme. So if you want to maybe switch that to start, hit save. And now we're using start. If you want to switch it to like Bartek or something, it'll be blue. And actually if we go to just make it so it's more noticeable, if we go to modules. This is a recommendation also to uh, disable certain content type, uh, certain modules here. There's going to be as you can see, it says overlay. And now we've gotten rid of the annoying overlay, which is a resource intensive object. You don't need it. So now, as you can see, instead of it hovering over our 
website, it takes up the entire page. But, but essentially, this is uh, in terms of our themes, where we want to manage our themes, which themes we want to use, the themes we want, like our default themes. Essentially, again, it's so intuitive and so easy to use. You just click Appearance, and that will take you to where you would manage your themes. And again, there's um, each, within each theme, there are some settings you can manage. Um, I'll quickly I'll show you this. There's little things like um, you know background color. Um, and every theme has its own configuration settings. Display things you can have. Well, you know, there's you can toggle displays whether you want the logo to show or not, site name, so forth and so on. Um, and you can save you save that configuration, and that would be applied to that particular appearance for that theme that you're that you just uh, assigned that to. Um, again, this is where you would do your theme management. There's more advanced stuff that you can do here, but that'll that'll be for another uh, presentation. Set the administrator to back to seven, just so that we can continue with the demo. Um, another thing you may want to, well, that you may or may, depending on your role, you may or may not want to do, you may find the need to extend Drupal's core functionality. You may find the need to do something that Drupal doesn't currently have. So that may require you to go get a module or a plugin. Where you would do that is this option here, modules, will bring up this screen here. This will show you all the modules that you currently have. These are all Drupal's core modules, everything except for my Added last night. Um, so I, last night I found that I needed a, a uh, to extend the core function because I didn't have an editor when I was modifying the content. So I went to Drupal.org. Um, So I'm on Drupal.org, as you can see. Um, the quickest way to do this, um, there's many different ways. You can actually download the module, have it on your file system, and then upload it onto your system. Or you can just go down to the actual section here. I'll right click on the, 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 the tar here. I'll say copy link address. Then I'll go back to my Drupal instance. There's an option over here that says install new modules. I'll click that link. I can right click in that box right there. I'm not going to do it now because I already did it, but then you would see your um, your newly installed module inside of your module section down, down here. Then to enable it, you just simply, simply click this checkbox here to enable it so that you can actually then use it. Um, that would be the same with just about any module you would find out there. There's social media things you may or want to use, analytics tools that you can use. There's lots of libraries and APIs that you can leverage to integrate with Drupal, which is another one of the great things that I found with Drupal. There's almost nothing that it can't handle. Uh, we found it to meet all of our needs, things that it didn't, didn't, it didn't come with before we were able to find it module or plugin. Um, and last but not least, the other thing that may be important when you're coming to a Drupal site is under, this is some more, some of the advanced stuff, but this is your configuration um, section, uh, options here. Um, the important <coughs> thing over here is um, site information. If you wanted to go in here and change the name of your site, give it a you can give your site a slogan if you choose to, a default email address. You can have a number of posts. Um, in this case, um, for this set to 10, but we can change that number and have a number of posts on a page, on a front page, or whatever number you find there. As we said before, when you're assigning content to the front page, you can define how many content types, uh, how many pieces of content are listed before they drop off the bottom of the list. So by defining 10, the maximum amount is going to be is 10 on the front page, and the 11th one will not show up. And if we wanted to have, uh, if we had a particular uh, node or page that we wanted to make our front page, we can make it, we can force it to be the front page by adding that node here. I had to put that <coughs> once, I put that there, and that's going to be the page that appears in the front every time somebody goes to the home page. You can also have error pages. You can assign those error pages if you have them. And that's where they would, um, you can you know, say no, whatever, uh, to or whatever the, you know, that error page is, so forth and so on. You can also have a default for, for a page not found if you have that custom page that you want to display every time somebody can't find the resource on your application. Then you would go 
would save. I'm not going to save anything here because I like uh, the default configuration. But those options are available in site information. Uh, one thing uh, that we also often have to do when um, if you've done something like you created a basic page and you don't see something or if there's a performance issue and you're, quite, you're not quite sure what's going on, the quickest troubleshoot mechanism that I found was to go to performance and clear your cache. Clearing your cache um, flushes uh, things out and kind of gets things back in order. And that's usually my, my first rule of thumb if something's not going right. I go and clear my cache, and that's how you do it there. And then if things are still not working here, then you got to go through the rigmarole troubleshooting, um, looking at why you were having that particular issue. Drupal automatically caches all templates uh, so they're faster to load when you put in a request. So that's why when you're developing, you'll want to clear the cache because you'll be seeing the last compiled version of your templates every single time. So once you've cleared the cache, it'll recompile those templates for whatever the recent code is that you've implemented. So this config in, in configuration, there's way more other options. There's things about your, your user interface that you can manage. Um, development, you, know, you can manage, you can have um, your site in a maintenance mode if you'd like to, so people can't see what you're Ton of options here. Some of them more advanced. Some of them, um, you know, maybe a site administrator would, would do, or a, a advanced developer, or what have you. But all those options, in terms of configuration, your site information, um, are going to be found under configuration, or most of them. And um, with that, I will stop for questions. Maybe. Tim, when you were um, adding all those fields. <coughs> It seemed like a real easy way to set up a database. And so if you set up a database, this is a MySQL database, do you access it outside of Drupal, all that data? Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty, yeah, because it just seems like a real handy tool to yeah. quickly get a, a database up quickly. And what it's actually doing in the back end is it's establishing a, uh, it has a table called fields, and every time you define a field, it actually creates, it defines that field in the fields table. And then you can actually have a, once you've created a field, you can assign it to multiple content types. Uh, we didn't actually get into that, but if, uh, when you're in the add new fields, there's actually a second option in there where you can add an existing field. So once you've created a custom field, you can also reuse it in other content types. Well, that's very cool. Yeah. You just, you know, doing database. Lots of people actually utilize Drupal as their back end for a front end application. For instance, if you're making a mobile application, you can make it so that Drupal, instead of providing a page to a request, it can actually provide things like JSON or XML. And so you can actually use Drupal as your uh, graphical user interface to manage your data on the back end for some custom applications in the front end. And, and again, one of the things I mentioned at the beginning is I, I installed Acquia Dev Desktop 2. I have a hook into my actual Drupal instance, which we were, we were just looking at for our demonstration. I can also, and I'll quickly just show you this, I can access the site structure. And this is the back end of Drupal. Um, this is what, this is more advanced stuff. We're not going to get into any of this stuff now, but this is where our themes are managed. This is where uh, our site, you know, we have site information, we have modules, we have things like that. They encourage you, if you're going to do anything um, in here, they encourage you to make a copy. Always make a copy of your theme. This is Drupal 7, so everything you'll be doing is actually under the Sites folder. You won't be editing anything outside of the Sites folder because that is technically core. And the rule of thumb with Drupal is do not. <coughs> and the reason I came back over here to just dev that up too is to also show you that you can actually manage your database. Oh, cool. You come right in here, and your database is right here for you. And again, I wouldn't, I would um, stress that this is more, you know, um, advanced stuff. You know, but um, again, if you need to do something. Query, cut something, uh, drop a table, or which I suggest you don't do. You don't want to. You, know, you can do all that here. You can also do backups here and see your backups. But you have a, with Dev Desktop 2, I found that to be very, very useful that I can just go to one place and with one click of a button access what I want. The back end system, um, the actual application.
application or the database. And if you are editing the database, it is uh, recommended to just use Drush. Oh, um, I wanted to get into Drush today. Eric Strong suggested that I didn't. I Eric, didn't. Yeah, so. he, uh, and I, I, from what I understand, he covered it last month, I think, or whatever the case is. I would say this. Um, Drush is a very, very useful. Um, we won't get into it today, but it's a, it's a handy tool that lets you do a lot of what you just saw me doing on the application end. I could have did a lot of that through a command line tool like Drush. I could have managed my user. I can do things like site updates. I can do uh, cron jobs all within one place with Drush. If you're more familiar with a command line, then Drush is an option that you would want to utilize. With that, um, I will conclude this beginner's presentation. I wish I could get to some of the more advanced stuff, but maybe another. When you take your old website and migrate into Drupal, what's the procedure you guys taking to, you know, clean up your data, you know, creating content side, taxonomy and stuff? So what's the procedure you guys go into move on? One of the, um, that's a great question, actually. Um, um, in terms of our method and our strategy to take the content that we currently have from the old system into the new system, we have a couple of options that we're, we're tinkering with and we're, we're actually exploring. We have a custom solution that we've been working on um, utilizing JSON, JSON, some XML, and um, it's a Java application that kind of targets tags, certain HTML tags. We can um, um, sanitize those tags and import it into a flat file, database, what have you. That's still a work in progress. But before we even get to that, what we've been doing in the last year or so is um, we've been uh, running a lot of what we use a lot of audit tools to see if, to make sure we don't have any broken links, any orphan files out there. We've also been doing things like um, contacting our different divisions and content providers to find out what content do they need and what do they not need. Where are they going to bring over the things that we want used in a new system? So we've been doing, uh, doing that regularly. Um, we've also been um, working on our site structure, making sure that optimal, making sure that things are where they need to be so that when we're bringing things over, it's as straightforward as possible from a project standpoint. But it won't be. A, it, when you're converting everything over, you're not going to be moving CSS or JavaScript because that's all presentation based and Drupal will be doing the presentation. So what you'll be focusing on is the content of your page along with any files like PDFs, Excel spreadsheets, and images. And images. Correct, because um, we are doing kind of the same stuff and that's the hardest part, you know, reaching out to those program people, specific area people, and keep in contact with them. Yeah. But the people sometimes think just taking a page out from their own website and just putting it in Drupal, which is not what we're trying to do. We're trying right. to completely, you know, and that's what I was thinking about what procedure you guys take. It like, seems like you guys are doing good. Yeah, and I, we've reached out to um, other um, state entities and other people that have done this before. What we found a lot is that um, it's either two paths P um, entities are taking. They're either doing a full redesign and saying we're not going to bring our stuff over say, so they'll start from scratch and do a redesign, or, they're, or they are going to bring things over, and then in that case, you would have to do the things that we're talking about, utilize APIs, libraries, or some kind of custom solution. Drupal does or have migrate. the migrate, yeah, my, there's a couple of um, options out there, migrate, there's a migrate module that, um, that we're looking at, <coughs> there's also a HTML import, <coughs> the, another uh, module, it's on Drupal.org, you can look at that, that also can assist in bringing at least a good percentage of your stuff over and get you, you know, somewhat there, then the rest people may have to use your custom solution or another option. So between HTML import, uh, migrate module. Pearson um, for this too. Yeah, yeah, or that's another one. Or custom web scrapers, which basically just take your content, filter it through, and you get the raw data and just dump the data straight into the database. I just want to point out that Jeff is in the communications office. And I think the whole agency is really used to looking for communications for having clean communication. And so we're used to working with them, and that makes it, I think, maybe because we're just as positioned, it makes it easier to do that restructuring. Where yeah. Right. You know, there's already buy in. Right. That that's a we good thing a, to do. We have a hand. I mean, our division.
Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. That's pretty cute. I should have one. That was done earlier. <laughs> that is kind of cool. And normal, I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll see how it works. It's a wild west. Totally paperless, which is very different for me. So hopefully everything is charged. I guess we'll get started in about a minute. I'm sure some people can join us again. And also, Courtney pointed out the nice car. Well, I'm going to get started. There might be another person who joins us. Um, good morning. And thank you, Justin Patrick. Um, you guys actually kind of want to build a little bit on some of what you guys said. So. Uh, this is a very high level kind of introduction to Drupal 8 theming, and it's really based on my experiences over the last couple of months working with a great team of people um, who. 
experiment and play with Drupal 8. And I know there's some other people in here who are playing with Drupal 8 now. So anyone wants to add anything, feel free. Also, um, feel free to ask questions similarly at any point. Uh, my name is Samantha Case, as you might have seen. And I also want to highlight that I am a English major and librarian by background, and I did proofread my own intro. So there's at least a couple of uh, grammar and typos, so I apologize in advance. Um, so it's definitely human. So first of all, what do, just to kind of set the stage, what do people think of when they think of theming in relation to Drupal or otherwise? Anyone willing to share what theming is to them? Yeah, so um, HTML template, CSS. Yeah, I saw your hand. Just some words in the wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Great minds, you know. <laughs> Anything? How are you going to present your website to people? Mm -hmm. yeah. The presentation, presentation layer, right? Good old. Sometimes you're working from a Photoshop file or maybe wireframes. It's your interpretation of what is needed to create that interaction layer with, uh, with visitors and such. And also with your content authors. Um, that's mm -hmm. part of it, too. So I also kind of see it kind of, especially in the Drupal world, it kind of yeah. moves into site building, sometimes what you would call, like how you choose to put things together. So we're going to kind of touch on a few things <clears throat> related to that. So first of all, theming in general, we probably, if you work with theming, you have some different tools, methodologies you like. Um, but how does that apply in the world of Drupal 8? How is Drupal 8 maybe different from Drupal 7? So what can you kind of, some background um, that can help you get ready for working with Drupal 8? And I think one of the main places to start would be they actually wrote up um, a CSS architecture document for Drupal 8. And if you visit it, Um, it's got a lot of the <coughs> a lot of the theories and fundamentals that are becoming popular or have been popular in working with front end development. Um, you know, working with CSS, keep your selectors kind of realistic. Let's not have that beyond like five selective view thing. Um, don't rely too much um, on specific uh, classes to the Drupal world. Um, and such, you know, you want to kind of keep it component-based, things that can be reused, uh, keep it scalable. So those are just a lot of the good CSS, good theming front-end fundamentals that they really tried to take to heart when working on Drupal 8. And Drupal 8 theming is really a reimagining of uh, the theming layer for Drupal. So it's kind of exciting and it's kind of weird. Uh, but it's uh, that it's great because it's also reaching out. You, you'll hear in Drupal world that we're on the island, get off the island. Has anyone heard that, get off the island? People shot nodding their heads. It's basically, Drupal has kind of been its own little world. It's got its Drupalisms, it's got um, theories, implementation that are become very Drupal specific. With Drupal 8, they're trying to get away from that. Um, and in theming, that's one of the areas. So. Things like using Smacks, people heard of that. Um, it's, a, it's a theory of um, scalable and modular, modular architecture of CSS. Uh, it's, it's that components idea. And also naming conventions using them, like block element modifier. So you really, you're working um, based on components and such. So let's, let's, let's get into actually looking at a little bit of that. So how is D8 different from D7? So let's go look at some actual uh, environments. I will if you want to that. So I, similar to Jeff, am using a Dev Desktop. Dev Desktop is a great environment to get up and running. You basically download it and you have an environment on your computer, Mac, PC, and you're ready to go. Um, the great thing about it also, let me bring it up. 
not let me enlarge it though, uh, is that you'll see over here if you create a new Drupal site, you have distributions to um, choose from. So you can choose Drupal 7 as Jeff and Patrick did. You can choose Drupal 8 to explore. And also there are some distributions that um, maybe Drupal 7 at this point, but there's also, they already have a couple of Drupal 8 distributions which are kind of nice to look at because you can see how they've solved some of the issues around the fact that Drupal 8 is still an evolving um, platform. There's still a lot of shortfalls in how media is handled, how um, you can do certain things. So uh, I would recommend uh, there's Thunder um, distribution, which is put out by a publishing group in Germany, I believe. And also, there was Lightning here. Lightning, there it is at the very top which is um, an Acquia uh, Drupal 8 distribution. So those are both worth looking at because also as Jeff pointed out, once you download and install it in your dev desktop, you can then see the file structure. You can then see any of the code that they've created to use. So, and we're first gonna look at interface. So how is the Drupal theming um, interface different on D7 and D8? As you can see, the default, um, theme that is applied when you spin up a new site in D7 or D8 is good old Bartik. Um, just pointed out, not too flashy, but it does the job. And we're going to look at appearance again, which is this area. And again, very, very familiar. Uh, anybody notice one thing right off the bat? Overlay's gone. The what? Overlay's the, gone. The overlay's gone. Yeah. Thank goodness. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> the overlay is gone. That, um, can cause AJAX issues, the loading issues. It's just, and also sometimes for the content author, it's just a <coughs> confusing experience. So you just within the browser. So we have our appearance, and it's, again, you, you see Bartik seven, and that's a, pretty much all you see at, um, on a base install. Uh, you have some of the similar things. So if you go to settings and D seven, you have your good old color picker. <coughs> These are all options. Also in D eight. So the one thing you might notice that's a little different is down at the bottom, this is a D8. You can do a few things here, such as um, set up the short cut icon, which is like the favicon, um, D7. But in D7, there's a few more things. There's things like logo, site name, site slogan. Now, you can turn them on and off, which is great, and they'll, they would have by default gone up into the header and stuff. Um, in D8, the cool thing is, is that they have redone the block structure also. And the block structure is um, just a lot better because it's now fieldable. So you can do more with a block. You're not just stuck with a, a title and a, a text area, essentially. Um, you can add fields to it. You can create custom ones. Um, I'm just going to go quick over to the block area. So again, these are all things that I kind of see as in the theme world, ways of interpreting what you're supposed to be sharing with your users um, in, in your Drupal um, structure and setup. So the, the block area is kind of similar to D7. <coughs> I'm, and I'm using a basic install. Um, you can see over here, that's D7, D8, same thing, the different regions um, that you might be familiar with if you've worked with sub themes themes in Drupal before. So the cool thing is, is that you'll see that up in the header, there's this site branding. Ah, I can enlarge it a little. I think I go instantly. The other cool thing is D8 is a mobile-friendly administrative theme, so, which is really nice. If you want to edit on the go, you can. Um, so you have a site branding block. And if you go into configure, we actually see our site logo, site name, and uh, slogan here. So you can turn it on and off. You can have different elements display. If you want them, if you don't, you can take site logo off. And I go back to the site. Um, I just open it in a new tab. I hit refresh. The logo should be gone. I'm sorry. And thank you, Ginger. And if you save, it makes a big difference. <laughs> See, I had to have a couple plants. 
There we go. Look at that magic. Um, so it's really easy. And the cool thing is, is that you could, if you wanted to, for whatever reason, you can reuse blocks. So if, again, if you scroll down, um, again, Justin Patrick touched on the navigation. You'll see that the main navigation, which you can set up through structure, is in the primary menu region. Um, what if you wanted it someplace else before you would have had to create a custom block? It was kind of a, kind of a painful process, but if for some reason you actually wanted to put it, let's say, in a sidebar, you can um, actually go down and see that, oh, look, there's, you can put another instance of it in. So the block um, interface has just been expanded. It's, it's um, got a lot of uh, a great features that you might want to take into consideration when creating your um, user interface. So blocks, explore them. They're fieldable. They're awesome. <coughs> Entities are a wonderful thing. Okay. So that's blocks. And again, any questions? Feel free at any point. Um, so we've kind of, those are the highlights of the front end I wanted to um, talk about. Um, when we were looking at the appearance screen, um, you'll remember that we only saw um, in eight, we only saw Bartik and seven, seven being the administrative team. Down here, start, which you can use to help debug code, um, literally takes out the theme um, elements so that you, with no styling, so you can see what's going on with your code. So, is that all we get? I mean, that's Martech's great, but you know, what what do we do if I want to create my own custom thing? Um, so if you actually look at code base, and I'm just going to my dev desktop and clicking the link. Doing something that my computer didn't want to do. Um, it's, Ooh. All right, sorry, I apologize. This is hard to see. Um, there's the Drupal 8 folder structure for this one. It's pretty, it's pretty slim compared to. I'm just clicking on Drupal 7. Instantly, you see it's a lot larger. And as Patrick pointed out, you don't want to do in 7. You don't want to do anything other than touch what's in the site folder. Otherwise, your hacking core kittens will die, as they say. And also. <laughs> Um, if you have to do a security update, you're in deep trouble, as I think many of us have experienced in the past. Um, in Drupal 8, there is a core folder separately, and actually at the top level, you'll see there's a modules folder, there's a themes folder. You'll actually be putting your themes and modules in there probably, unless you do a profile, which is a way of um, grouping a distribution together, let's say. Um, you might put it in there, but you'll probably be actually working within themes folder or the modules folder, and you'll notice they're pretty much empty. Uh, it's a good idea when you're doing things in Drupal to create a custom and a contrib folder. That way you can keep separate these, those nice modules or themes you download from d.o, drupal.org. Keep them in the contrib folder. Anything custom you do, sub-theming um, and such, you would want to put in the custom folder. Just believe me, it'll save you a lot of heartache down the road. Um, right now I'm going into the core folder, and within that you'll see that these, these um, naming conventions are repeated. So once you go into core, you see, oh, themes there. So then you're looking at the themes folder. So there is a nice logic um, to follow. And when you're in the themes folder of core, you can't probably read it, but you can actually see that there is a lot more than the three that we saw through the appearance page. And the two that we're mostly thinking of is classy um, and um, Stable. Now those are themes that are actually built off of core, uh, the core theming level. Um, and that's what makes Drupal 8 really cool is um, stable and classy. And what they've done with the theme layer is they've stripped out a lot of the extra div, the dividus, the extra classes and such. And um, then they've created a very clean base theme called stable which Classy is actually built on Stable, and which all of your themes you're going to see out there are going to be either built on Stable or Classy, probably, because 
You don't want to build straight on core because core, the theme, they might change it. They might improve it. They want to keep it clean. And stable will always be that buffer to make sure that once they do a core update, your theme doesn't all of a sudden break. So um, you'll be theming off of one of the other um, if you decide to do your own theme. And an article that's really great from uh, Lilabot is a tale of two base themes. It gives a terrific, besides having a lovely picture, uh, a terrific overview of the two base themes, classy and stable. And I will make these links available. I definitely have those organized. Um, but the first thing you might notice here, this is classy markup of a, a set of fields. It's pretty clean, right? I mean, cleaner than you might see in a lot of um, Drupal installations. If you keep going down, that same, um, that same information, if you use the stable theme, is this. It's even cleaner. You don't have the classes, but it's, it's pretty darn clean. Now, this is where, if you're doing your own custom theme, you'll probably be playing a lot with um, uh, Twig, which we'll talk about in a minute, in order to add your own classes so that you can actually do the styling you need to do um, for your site. So, and this is this next example, even a, a bigger highlight. So this is just one field um, in classy versus stable. So you'll see that it brings in a lot of the uh, the field names from when you created that field and other elements, which can be very helpful, but sometimes it's more than you need. So, uh, right. um, so that's just kind of a high level talk about the core themes that you would see within a base install, um, the stable, classy. Arctic is actually built on top of Classy, um, Stark, and Seven. Now, Contrib, now the question is, what's the state of Contrib? Because, of course, V8 is also a very recent. Um, we just did 8.1 at the beginning of April. So, um, Contrib modules and themes are kind of in their early stage. Now, Foundation and Bootstrap, they already have um, they already are up and running. They have uh, Dev and Alpha and pretty um, active. Uh, actually, they might even be on Dev and Alpha. Zen and Omega are de um, Dev and Alpha, uh, and Zen is built on Classic. Now, Foundation and Bootstrap, um, they might be frameworks you're familiar with, Zurb um, or Bootstrap Foundation, and you might love them. And the cool thing about um, the very clean markup of classy and or stable is that it's very uh, amenable to taking those frameworks and implementing them. So that's why these those themes were up and running early, and you can also do that with other frameworks if you really like them. Um, the other thing about contrib modules, um, Zen and Omega, they have, Zen uses a special framework um, layout grid that you might like. Uh, Omega, um, people really like the, they do a lot with the interface sometimes with the current developer. <clears throat> so those might be things that sell those themes for you. Uh, but the cool thing about core, if you go back to core and stable and classy, is that they've cleaned so many of the things that made theming in Drupal hard before. Um, there's a temp the template system is a little bit more straightforward. It's a little easier to um, to control the element and the output to the screen as you as you want it. So you might want to consider doing your own your own custom theme. This is what we're doing. Um, so what goes into uh, a Drupal theme? We already looked at blocks. We saw the region. So we're actually let's look at go back at the uh, go back into the folder structure. And look at what what makes up a, uh, a theme. I'm going to go back to core, and look at Arctic because that's built on top of Classy. Now, within here, you might not be able to read it, but there's um, several elements that you'll see in pretty much everything. What you definitely need is the info file. People might be familiar with the info file from V7. It's now an info.yaml file. YAML is YAML, uh, what does it stand for? YAML is 
not markup language. Um, or YAML is markup language. It's a self-referential <coughs> name. <coughs> what? YAML 8. YAML 8? YAML 8 markup language. Thank you. I knew it was something. We call it ain't markup language. So it's used by Symfony, which is the PHP framework which is being used in Drupal 8. So all of these um, technologies relate to each other. Symfony is how it's the basis of the PHP framework for Drupal 8. Twig is a um, templating en engine that is um, often tied to Symfony, and YAML is also for sharing information. Um, and it's just it's, it's different and what we've been seeing in Drupal 7, and it's part of that getting off the island, getting off of the isolated Drupal 7 world, um, and using more broad, broadly implemented um, technology. So basically, for a theme, you definitely need um, an info file. This I will enlarge. <coughs> I can't. So right off the bat, it's very similar to an info file you would have seen in um, Drupal 7, except they use a colon for the, the key value pairing. Um, you need to, again, name it. You need to say what type it is. That's a required um, element now. Uh, base theme, you'll see it's being built on top of Classy. Your description that will appear in the appearance section, um, libraries. And then the regions down here. So you'll see that <coughs> Bartik has all of these special regions that you can then use to put things like the blocks and such onto the block interface. So you need this info file in order to create um, your theme. Now, libraries. You might be wondering why, what is this here actually? Um, in the past, we used those sort of square brackets and such to indicate CSS and stuff. Library is another fi a YAML file that you're going to have, probably have in your, your theme. Um, and the great thing about it is that you can, you actually can indicate CSS and JavaScript, how you need it, how you use it. jQuery by default in V8 is not loaded on every page. Um, you need to call it if you need it somewhere. And that helps your load times, it helps your usage. You other JavaScript, um, it's really up to you. So this library's um, doc field, YAML file, is where you'll be um, indicating a lot of your CSS and JavaScript. Um, so within your theme folder, you'll probably also have um, a theme file, which kind of essentially takes the place of your template.php file. Um, some themers get into creating those pre-processed things that go, they take a chunk of code and they go through it and they add things to it as you want. Um, you can do that in D8, obviously, and you're going to be doing it in a .theme file. Now, you might not have to because what we're going to talk about next quickly is Twig structure. And the Twig structure is basically your templates. And the templates are, uh, very easy to look at, to use, um, and they allow you to dig into um, a lot of the, the control you need over your HTML. So, the other cool thing that is in code um, is a file called your breakpoints file, YAML breakpoints. Um, so, this is where you would indicate your breakpoints, your overall breakpoints for your site, like how you want what. What do you want your mobile, your tablet, your desktop to stay on? And this can be then used by the Drupal core or any of the contributed modules um, in order to um, have that responsive uh, experience for your end user. So in this case, um, what we've been using it for is, or what we plan to be using it for, is now in Drupal 8, the pictures module, anyone familiar with the pictures module, responsive images? So pictures module and responsive images um, were built for Drupal 8 and they've been backported to Drupal 7. So even if you're working in Drupal 7, you might want to check out pictures and responsive images because 
It allows, it also, these all work with the image styles within Core that you might be familiar with. Image styles is where you can indicate um, when someone uploads an image to a content type, um, as um, Jeff and Patrick were illustrating before, you create fields and you can create a field where you have an image, let's say. Let's say someone uploads those nice grandiose 2,000 by 3,000 pixel images, right? You don't want that showing up on your, on your computer. Uh, on someone's computer. So in image styles, you can indicate that, that for that field, um, what's going to be displayed in the display portion is like a 500 by 500 image, right? So you can create various image styles that can then work with um, a picture mile and a picture module and responsive images to say that at this viewpoint, at a module viewpoint, take, an, take the image at a 200 by 200. Um, size. So then it's only loading the smaller 200 by 200 images, not just squeezing it down based with CSS. So it keeps the load time for a, mo for a mobile um, tablet and desktop appropriate to um, the person's viewpoint. So breakpoints, it's a great tool. Um, you probably want to look into it. Some of the other Basic one, screenshot. Again, so in the appearance page, you can get a, a slight idea of what the uh, theme is going to look like when implemented. So this is a small screenshot of Arctic. Um, you could put your logo in here. Now these folders, um, the ones you're probably most likely to have are images. So images that are related specifically to your theme. You'll want to put them in that folder. Uh, CSS. If you're doing straight CSS, which is coming back in Bo into Vogue, so you could put, do that, or you could have a SAS folder that then outputs to a CSS folder, and templates folder. And this is where you would put any template, any Twig template, that will override core. So um, Bartik is built on it. So by default, Bartik is going to be using any of Classy's Templates. So if you go to, I'm in the Classy folder now, if you go into the Templates folder, you'll see that there's a lot of subfolders labeled Block, Content, Data Set Field. These are all filled with um, Twig templates that are then accessible to your theme if you've been built, if you're building on top of Classy, which Bartik is. So in Bartik, you'll notice that within the Templates folder, got about a dozen or so templates here. These are instances where they are overriding what the core, what, what class these templates are doing. So they wanted to add some special functionality to it. So before we get into that, what is Twig? <laughs> Twig is basically um, it's just the theme engine. Um, in D7, the theme engine was something called PHP template. And PHP template is actually in Drupal 8 if you want to use it. Um, so it kind of takes your data, it takes the templates, it mixes them together um, through the template engine, and you get your HTML output on the screen. Okay, so what is, how is Twig different? Um, Twig is very different in a couple of ways. Um, it's way more secure. In D7, you could actually literally put in your, in your um, template Maybe query drop table and it would drop your database. So I buy data. So it's it you can't do that in Twig. Um, in Twig you can do certain things. You'll see syntax like this: double curly brackets. So that's basically a, a variable output, like let's say your field. Um, and then you could have something with percentages that is going to be more executing a statement. So you do have some um, logic that is available to you. In and then this last one is basically just um, a comment, a good old pound hash comment. They're definitely more secure. And it's intimidating because you might be thinking, what the heck is this Twig stuff? Why do I have to learn another, another thing? Um, the, the nice thing about Twig is besides those basic three um, indicators, it's going to be HTML. It's, it's going to be very familiar to you. So, so Twig, Twig is... Um, it's pretty straightforward, and I'm, I'm going to open up the 
classy template content layout. Um, HTML, HTML, Twig. This is basically the highest up you can get. This is this is the Twig file that affects a whole page. Um, and if you look in here, you'll see that there's your HTML, your head, title. It's going to do in, in, insert the uh, CSS. Then you have your body, um, and then. And you see in the double curly backgrounds of page and page top and stuff, that's just going to be calling other two templates. So this kind of nesting of templates. Um, so how do you know what template you want to use? Let's say that you're creating your own theme and you actually want to control um, something on, let's say, uh, your article um, content type. Well, you would, you could just guess. You could start going through the template files and looking at them. But the cool thing about um, Twig is that there's this thing called Twig Debug. And I think at least a few people have heard of Twig Debug. Um, it's, it's, it's a really terrific tool. So I am in, I'm still in my Drupal 8 uh, code base. I'm actually going into Sites, Default. And you'll see here that there's a default services YAML file. Again, the services YAML file is going to have information about how to run certain things. So if oh, of course I'm going to copy it. I'm going to actually do a command C, command D. And since this is a, a system, I'm asking you to say you really want to do that. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a services.yaml file instead of a um, default. And when I open it. Um, a lot of information about how your site should run, but basically you'll see this one area called Twig Config and Twig Debug. And in the resources I have put links to stuff about this, but basically by default it's false. You don't want this running on your production server. You don't want a bunch of comments inserted into your, to your HTML output. So, but locally, if you type true, auto reload, it's always good true, um, cache, false is um, save that. Now I'm going back to the browser, and this is my Drupal 8 site before hitting refresh. I did save, I remember to hit save that time, um, but I haven't refreshed. So I'm going to do a quick inspect element, our good old buddy Firebug inspect element. And if you look at it, first of all, it's pretty clean div, divs for, for Drupal period, but you'll notice that it's pretty straightforward. It's just it's a div um, classes. So then when I refresh, oh, nothing happened because what do we like to do often? Clear cache. Clear cache. <laughs> so you'll want to clear cache. You can do that through the appearance <coughs> interface. Um, the other cool thing about um, Drupal or Aqua Dev Desktop, this icon over here is going to take you to your command line. So you can also do a drush CR, which is new, it's not CC and D7, it's CR and D8. But basically all it does is it clears your cache. Wait a few seconds because you're staring at it. So now when I hit refresh on my page, you see some cool green stuff. And I'm actually going to So if you look here, there's a lot of nice information. So just by turning that on, you get to see what templates are outputting what to your screen. So as we we're looking at HTML, obviously that's at the top, and that is um, the little X indicates that's what's being used currently. And then these are suggestions. These are hints at what template or what files you might want to create. So how anyone want to guess how you would create one? Let's say you wanted to override your um, front page to your site. Anyone want to? Yes? Just a wow button. Yes. When I make a copy of the HTML front, um, YAML. Uh, the Twig file. The Twig, um, Twig file. Yes, yep. they're all they're similar. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yes. We go into core, grab that HTML, that HTML, that Twig, make a copy of it, and then where do we put it? 
we keep it in core? Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, we don't want to put things in core. So we would just take a copy, put it in our Teams folder. Um, if you wanted each, if you want to override the general layout of all of your HTML pages, you could then just leave it HTML to HTML because it would pick that one first because it's within your theme. But since we were talking about the front page, we would rename it HTML dash dash front dot HTML twig and it would override what is on the home page. So um, as you can see, if you go down through which ones are actually currently being used, um, toolbar, and what ones you could use. You could have things node specific. Ideally, you wouldn't because that could bite you in the butt later. Um, but let's look at an actual twig file because I think we are in, we're doing bar tick. Now, the sub theme, I would have actually gone into, I'm at the doc root, in the themes folder, I would create custom theme. Now let's say that I wanted to adjust bar tick. We don't want to do it in here. And ideally, you probably wouldn't do it this way either. Um, I'm copying bar tick my custom themes folder. Um, in order for it to really work, you would, in your info file, you would be overriding it. Such. I don't know if this is even going to work. This is called on the fly. Um, I'm going to open the page.html template because I'm already editing it. So, this doesn't have any of the instances I wanted to. I'm actually going to go into a current Drupal 8 site that we're working on. <laughs> I'm looking at Ryan. Um, and uh, I'm going to quick just pull up a, an example file to show one more thing about um, about twig templates, which is really neat. And I'm still learning, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. <clears throat> I'm opening, this is a, a field level twig template. Um, and you can see, and this is where we're kind of going back to, remember we were talking about smacks and bands and some of those um, um, web um, thought processes. They, you can see in the naming convention that that's kind of part of it. So when you're naming things, you want to think about that block level and get down to more specificity um, that helps organize. So at this point, since it's field level, there's a lot of the, um, the statement-based twig things. So it's basically looping through any instances of this field. And what you can do with twig is up here at the top, you can indicate, you can set variables. Um, so what we're doing right now is creating classes. And what we want to do is for every instance of a class, every instance of a field, we want to add a, um, um, a, a CSS class to it so that it's able to be themed. And the reason we're doing that is our theme is built off of stable, so there really aren't very many classes in there. So we need things to be able to grab onto and create um, uh, your SAS and CSS for it. So at this top, um, what it is is it's basically saying, okay, we're going to actually call it, we're going to create classes called key point dash dash, and then this concatenates the field name. And this keeps it a clean class. Um, if you see a pipe, this is a filter in Twig. It allows you to create filters to make sure that you have like clean strings or things um, different. You could do time. Uh, formatting and things of that nature. So basically what it does is it goes through and it creates um, fields. And we have down here the one other thing you have to do is you'll notice that within this div, you have the double curly bracket. So that means that it's a variable that's going to output something to the screen. And what it's going to do is add classes. And it's going to output these as classes variables 
that we indicated up here. So it's going to go through and for each item, and in this case for each um, key point field, it will uh, create that and then add the name of the field and its, it's interval um, output. So while twig files keep you safe from being able to directly affect databases and such, it does allow you to take those fields and manipulate them and get um, the kind of output you may want in order to style the page you need it. So twig debug is really important. There's also something called kint, K-I-N-T, which is really cool because then you can actually help you find the variables um, that are being, um, that are available to a particular page. I, you have to install the devel module and such in order to get that, but it's definitely worth looking into and my base itself, I don't have that. Um, and those are, honestly, those are the highlights of, of what um, I see as Drupal 8 being kind of different from Drupal 7, some of the elements. Um, and in the, in, my, in the document that I created for this um, presentation, I do have links to any of the resources I've already referenced, and I will copy and Eric to make sure that I get those someplace that people can see them if they're curious. Um, I, it, it links from everything from some of the um, standards that are being used in the thought process of, of setting up the Drupal 8 theme structure to some of the great presentations, because Drupal 8 is really new. There's not a lot of um, documentation out there, but there's starting to be some great presentations, um, including from the DrupalCon just the other week. Um, and everything down to um, something called, uh, I even included a link to style, uh, style guide driven development. And that's kind of going to, that's how I'm going to wrap this around to my own experience because this is based on what we've been learning as we've been working with Drupal 8. And one of the things that we've been doing is doing style guide driven development. Has anyone heard about that or does anyone do it kind of? Okay, so the theory behind that, and at least the way we're approaching it, and there's a variety of ways, is um, again, you're creating components. Let's say you're creating a header, you're creating a slideshow, um, you're creating a list of elements, you're creating something called like a featured card that highlights information. So you want that HTML to be clean and component based. Um, as well as the CSS. So there is a style guide that lives within our code base that whenever we make a, ch a change to the, the SAS files, it also updates the style guide. And we just make sure that the style guide is populated with clean HTML and it helps us keep the Twig file output clean too because we then test it in the style guide environment. And it's both a reference for ourselves and um, in the future, the site owners and um, content authors and site builders, um, but it's also a way of just testing to make sure that we're doing things. So that's um, that's how we're trying to keep things clean and component-based and be able to build on things um, as they're, they're created. Uh, questions? Comments? Because I know we've yeah. got a few. Can you, can you show the style guide? Do you have that? Sure. Let me see if I have it up and running because <laughs> yeah. that would be have my virtual. So I use using Aqua Dev Desktop to display today. We also, there's a couple of other ways of creating environments. You can use MAMP stack, um, MAMP stack windows. You can also popular these days as virtual um, machines. And there's a Drupal VR that is very um, powerful. So that's what we're doing. And Thank goodness. I'm glad that I'm glad that Chrome is smarter than me. <laughs> Remembers things better. So this is um, our living style guide as it exists. Um, it's not perfect. It's, um, as in all agile development elements, it's iterative and uh, um, a work in progress. The home page, the first page, we tried to keep it um, theory, and I have. And then if you click, oh, that's right, overview, the URL changed. 
Um, you can see some of the different elements in their own in, in process. So this is the uh, the HTML. You'll see that we're aiming for clean, so it's just block quote with a P within it, and then this is what the, the styling brings to it. Um, heading. We haven't really done ordered lists much. Um, color and font. I kind of tried to add a palette for reference. Fonts in usage components. This is where you start seeing some of the uh, different elements. It's still button styles. Again, a lot of times if you take a component inventory of your website or of, of existing sites, <coughs> you'll find that there are hundreds or dozens at least of button styles. So how does that help the user experience? You know, um, the, and also your own sanity, trying to keep track of things. So um, the nice thing about style guides is you should be able to reference everything that you have available to you um, and so that you can use it. So no, this is generated automatically by Gold. <laughs> By gulp. By gulp, anytime your CSS changes, right? Correct. So there is um, some behind the scenes magic, um, which is basically a gulp file that takes the SAS file, it compiles it, and it outputs it to both the CSS that is sent along with the code base up to um, production servers or development servers, and also creates um, a style guide. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? Meredith, have you worked with the Drupal console yet at all? Drupal console. Um, excellent question. A little. I think it's amazing. I used it. I did a module, and I used it to create the bare bones outline of the module, and it's, it's terrific. Now, Drupal console is, gosh, so it kind of works alongside Composer and things. Um, it, new. Um, it only works with Drupal 8, I think. Um, and it's just a terrific command line tool to help you start a module, update a module. It's just um, it's got a lot of... I follow them on Twitter. These guys, there's four guys who are just doing amazing things with it. But um, if you have anything else to add, I recommend the about the latest oh, I know they have some acquiescence. Yeah, um, and a lot of um, camps have had presentations on it, and I'm sure DrupalCon did too. So I would highly recommend people watching them because it's it's just it saves so much effort and time, and it also creates like the the, the structure correctly, you know, so it gives you less opportunity to mess up. That. Great, if I need to. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So what is it Drupal console. Anybody know when the um they're out. Are they already? Yeah, I've already been watching them. And that was my, Eric said we need to share something that we like. And I highly recommend going to DrupalCon New Orleans. Um, if you go to the um, conference site, if you go to the schedule section, you actually can see the description of the session and then the video is embedded. So you can watch it right there. And they also have a YouTube channel, but it's kind of nice to see the um, description. Morton DK, I would highly recommend his. Um, he has been very in, um, involved in the Drupal theme um, development. He is he is something to behold. He's um, he's got a great presentation style, and he presented at DrupalCon um, with some really interesting ideas. Some may or may not be applicable to what you want to do. Um, he also kind of took the components-based idea further. If you you probably couldn't really see it, but if you do look at a, um, a Drupal 8 theme folder at the templates, it's um, um, grouped by usually layout and other things. But he said, well, why not group those template files that you create by component? So kind of continuing this component theme, like you might create your SAS partials as component level, which is what we do with the style guide, and style guides laid out component level, and then also your template files could be component level too. So it's kind of Oh, 11.02. Virtual machine. There, um, it's Drupal VM. It's done by a guy named Jeff Kaling. Um, 
who works at Acquia. And um, honestly, if you're working with Acquia, they might introduce you to something called Bolt, B-O-L-T, that I think they just open sourced. And that uses Drupal VM with some special tweaks to create um, a local development environment. Anything else? Okay, thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you all for coming and have a nice day.